Very good. Well, we're now live, so that's uh, that's fantastic. Uh, thank you for uh, for joining us for this session. The session is about implanting Industry 4.0 into the post-COVID future. And uh, my name is Tim Nicholl, and I'm delighted to be hosting this session. I'm joined today by my fellow panelist, uh, Shalendra Asni, and we may be joined by Victor uh, when he comes in. Um, I'm going to ask my, my panelists, fellow panelists to introduce themselves in much more detail when they speak for their very first time. And they can explain to you the roles that they're playing. But um, this is concerned with the automation of traditional manufacturing industrial processes. We know this is critical now to productivity, to cost reduction, uh, and to process convenience. We know that the scope of the technologies driving the uh, potential automation is continuing to grow, and I'm, I'm sure in the conversations we'll be referring to the internet of things, cloud computing, autonomous robotics, to simulation, to big data, uh, augmented reality, 3D printing, cybersecurity. I could go on. Um, these technologies uh, lists, they grow. Uh, we know also that the project's driven very much by ideas around interconnectedness, about um, information transparency around the nature of technical assistance and decentralized uh, decision making. And that overarching purpose is to achieve uh, smart manufacturing processes driven by automation rather than routine manual labor. Uh, so we know that this fourth industrial revolution promises much. And as with the, the previous three, uh, the progress of the, so the revolution is not in question. I think what is and perhaps what we're going to pick up today is the extent to which business owners will see advantages and embrace the new technologies and techniques or the extent to which they're going to fail to adopt and they're going to lose out competitively. Um, I was just very interested looking at some of the latest reports, the IoT Analytics 2020 report, for example, noted adoption rates amongst the respondents of around 30% overall. Uh, rates of about 36% in North America, 27% in Europe, 20% in Asia, mainly focused on China. Um, they noted two leading adopters could be found in the automotive industries, but individual companies such as Siemens, GE, Boeing were identified as leading adopters. Um, and I think we, we understand the adoption of multi by multinational companies as well stated, but I think part of the question we're looking at today is what about smaller manufacturers? How do they gain access to the economic benefits um, available to them through the adoption? And um, linked to this is therefore how do we educate, how do we, how do we train business owners, how do we support them to learn, to adopt these new processes and techniques? And I think these issues are going to be picked up by the panel. Um, further, as with any revolutions, and I think we need to touch upon these uh, potentially huge societal impacts upon the adoption of 4.0, um, inevitably where automation replaces routine manual labor, there's going to be effects on local employment profiles, and it's often those in the most precarious and most vulnerable who are affected by such changes. Also, the ability to run dark, dark factories, for example, manufacturing plants that have very little human interaction um, opens up the possibility for manufacturing once again to be switched in terms of its location from low-cost labor environments. And we may see the repatriation of capital and wealth, um, reversing some of the trends we've seen in globalization. And inevitably, this is going to create a different skill base for manufacturing and um, this is where I'm particularly interested in this. Education systems will need, therefore, to adapt to meet the needs of your employers. So just finally, say it's really interesting to note that COVID has had a significant impact upon the automation of services. And this conference is an example of that kind of adaptation. Uh, interestingly, in the, the UK, as the economy is growing coming out of, of COVID, already employers are reporting a shortage of employees in the IT and computing space. And I think this is just the start of a bounce forward. And I think these are some of the, the trends and discussions that we're going to have internationally. So um, in considering all of this, could I now introduce my panelists and ask them to take, uh, take forward the debate? Um, if you would like to join in the debate yourselves, could I ask you to leave comments? And I'll try and pick them up as we go through the sessions. But also there's the, the mic opportunity as well. And if you wish to take the mic at some point, please indicate um, that you wish to do so and we'll find some time. So welcome to you all. Um, I will stop speaking now. And perhaps if I could uh, ask Shalendra first of all to, uh, to pick up the discussion and then we'll come to Asni. Yeah, thank you, uh, Tim. And uh, it has been wonderful once again uh, to be on this uh, panel with uh, Orasis. Uh, thanks uh, to Frank uh, for giving us this opportunity. I've been handling different topics uh, over the years and this topic is very close to my heart because uh, it uh, deals with manufacturing 
and manufacturing of ages coming from the first generation, second, third, and today what we are discussing is fourth generation. In fact, uh, people have been discussing the fifth generation also, which yes. I would briefly touch upon, where it would be a mass uh, customization uh, after the, the generation four, which is totally cyber physical. Uh, the next generation is going to be mass uh, personalization. A couple of manufacturers have already taken it up. Uh, a big high-end manufacturers so like Mercedes or um, Lamborghini and things, uh, people like that, who have been virtually personalizing the product uh, for uh, customers. So that could become a part of uh, Industry 5.0. But then today's context, we have Industry 4.0. Prior to getting into that particular concept, uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, I am uh, basically an engineer, passed out in 1974. So uh, 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 quite a good vintage, you can say. Um, uh, almost uh, 36 years ago, I passed out. And then thereafter, I did my post-graduation in 1977 from Indian Institute of Management and uh, in marketing, finance, and systems. And then thereafter, I worked in the corporate sector for 15 years where I was running operations uh, for uh, diesel engine manufacturing from 400 to 8,000 horsepower in which I introduced a lot many systems uh, to improve the productivity. So, for example, for 400 uh, horsepower engine, we were manufacturing around six to seven engines a month. In a month of Diwali, where we have five days of holidays, so in 23 or 24 days, uh, I produced 13 engines. So the concepts of improvement in productivity at that time were more on manual nature, more on the manipulation of uh, uh, apportioning uh, tasks to different teams and then management of time. So at that time, the productivity principles were entirely different. Uh, but then I could do that even manually without any help of all these uh, platforms like AI, IoT or machine learning or whatever those technologies that we are uh, discussing today. But then uh, after the uh, coming out of uh, the job situation, uh, I set up uh, my own uh, companies uh, in 1992, and today uh, we have clocked almost 29 years in business. And uh, the group, uh, I'm the chairman and managing director, and we have four companies, totally uh, run by my family members, uh, two daughters, two son-in-laws, and a son. So I have a session in place, and uh, uh, one of them is the manufacturing and electrical and electronics, and the second one is the information technology. And two others are where we are distributing products for diesel engine, automotive, oil and gas sectors. Having said that, uh, and having spent time, so much of time in uh, manufacturing, having uh, participated uh, in um, um, discussions uh, on uh, excellence in manufacturing, employment of different techniques, I personally feel that today is absolutely a, a good day to talk about uh, Industry 4.0. If we really take uh, last uh, 13 to 14 months of period, uh, COVID uh, has given us a lot many challenges, but it certainly threw upon us a lot many opportunities as well. What are those opportunities that we never looked at us uh, ourselves? We never looked at us in the mirror and tried to find out uh, what exactly was lacking. We were complacent. We were uh, totally inward looking. We were satisfied, but COVID brought about all these things and then today we have come to realize that what we have, we do not need, maybe, and what we should, we don't have it. And this is where the uh, practices of uh, manufacturing also came about, because the biggest hit that the manufacturing industry received was disruption in uh, supply chain management, disruption in liquidity, and the, the most important uh, force is the workforce. So the laborers, at least they're talking about India, we have migrant laborers coming from different uh, places. All of them, they went back to their villages. So even though the government opened uh, with 50 percent, 40 percent manufacturing capacities, the laborers were not there. And the systems or the processes were not totally automated. And that is where the need for automation was felt. People have, were totally reluctant to migrate to Industry 4.0 pre-COVID era. But today, everyone is talking about migration uh, for Industry 4.0, where they could uh, run the industry, they could meet the requirements of the industry post uh, uh, this uh, COVID uh, era, uh, even uh, without uh, workforce or for that matter, whatever that uh, basic minimum workforce is available to them. So therefore, the need uh, of this uh, Industry 4.0 was felt 
because of the challenges uh, thrown uh, by the covid and uh, uh, when we were uh, discussing these aspects naturally the global manufacturing community was also looking at uh, countries like india vietnam and uh, low cost uh, countries uh, for scaling up their production to meet their requirements because there were socio political issues with couple of countries uh, bilateral trades were not matching so everyone wanted to look for opportunities in low cost countries and typically talking about india scalability was the biggest problem now how could we achieve scalability it was only through uh, some kind of uh, automation and uh, the best is to migrate uh, to the industry 4.0 and naturally when we were looking at global demand to meet that particular global demand now we have to come up to, uh, at the level of quality and we needed to create some smart factories and smart manufacturing and that is where the need uh, for uh, industry 4.0 was felt and everyone has uh, started Uh, looking at uh, uh, employing or rather migrating to industry 4.0 and uh, this is where i think we will be touching uh, uh, the aspects of uh, how the te- technology is being employed uh, what are the advantages what are the skills required and issues to be looked at uh, as we go along but i think this should be good enough for me to open the discussion thank you very much thank you indeed sir uh, asni would you like to introduce yourself so Uh yes sure so uh, uh my name is Arseny I am a CBDO of uh, Espro team so we are based in Ukraine and uh, uh, we are mid-size uh, nearshoring software development company uh, that uh, providing uh, uh, for uh, for uh, wide range of companies uh, services but for manufacturing companies we are providing digital transformation which is a part of uh, industry 4.0 So shall I speech what I prepared please do yes I I think if you could continue yes then then we can come back Okay okay so uh, uh, I'm I'm a newcomer to this uh, meetings and uh, I thought what I can prepare from my side to put the input to this topic and uh, I had several interviews with our existing customers who are working in manufacturing uh, to understand how covid-19 changed the industry and what the expectations are uh, as we are mostly working with uh, medium and small businesses so i will show like the outputs that uh, we summarized from uh, those interviews uh, that are mostly connected to the types of businesses uh, like medium uh, and small manufacturing companies so in general we see two uh, main conclusions that uh, we raised first is connected to the supply chain So as I uh, already mentioned uh, uh, that before covid that w- uh, there was a trend to reduce the production cost due to cheaper workforce and uh, it caused the opening of productions in other uh, regions uh, in asia and uh, other ones so it made the supply chain more global for more businesses and those businesses that had manufacturing or suppliers across the globe they faced during covid uh, an issue that uh, uh supply chain were delayed due to lockdown and in addition uh, there was uh, cases where uh, management was locked in uh, uh headquarters without an option to visit the production centers that made uh, operations uh, more complicated uh, that's from one side from another side workforce is uh, always connected to the human factor so people can get sick uh, uh, get sick leave or make mistake and that's life So uh, uh during last years uh, artificial intelligence virtual reality and the internet of things are becoming more real and significantly uh, decreases the human factor and in this industry 4.0 means fully automated production and uh, we can feel this trend today and uh, this trend pushed to build more local supply chains uh, for uh, mid-size manufacturing uh because in automated production manpower cost is not the key and the uh, production can be transformed and uh, be placed more closer to the consumer so we see that uh, it's uh, one of the main trends where uh, uh supply chain get not uh, global but uh, more local to avoid the risks and in case of uh, more automated production uh, we have in uh, less uh, manpower cost and uh, it gives an option to uh, place a manufacturer 
closer to the consumer. Uh, the second trend that we see is uh, connected to uh, consumer demands. So uh, from consumer perspective, a demand, uh, uh, there is a huge demand for product customization. And we see that uh, the question that have uh, been raised is uh, should we develop uh, 10 items of something uh, for, like uh, as a custom order? So uh, in general, this question was uh, tough to solve before because uh, uh, in case if we want to uh, develop a small batch, uh, which is uh, always connected to some custom uh, development, is connected to smaller batches. So before it was... Uh, it means that uh, from production perspective, one person should talk to another, they should agree and change something in development cycle for making the small custom product. Industry 4.0 means integration between SCADA and ERP systems in order to achieve uh, operational efficiency and uh, uh, by end to end integration of a digital layout with the product uh, configuration. So we believe uh, that uh, small product customization demand will grow and uh, businesses need to transform this themselves to achieve efficiency. And the answer to this question, uh, should we develop 10 items of something, uh, is a yes, if we will be efficient. And uh, the main focus of uh, production is connected to uh, having this uh, uh, option to be more flexible, more agile, and achieve this uh, production efficiency. Uh, there are technologies that help to achieve it it's uh, digital twins and uh, other VR solutions that are becoming more and more popular. And the uh, product configuration is usually the digital layout, which is used by a customer, is connected to already SCADA and DRP system and gives an option to uh, uh, like preset the uh, various options to develop a product. It's connected to the second trend, and uh, we believe that... Uh, Customization is something that uh, uh, we already have, and uh, this demand will grow, and uh, that's something that uh, we should uh, keep in our mind. And Industry 4.0 uh, has an answer for this question by using uh, VR technologies. And uh, the last part, what uh, I wanted to highlight is uh, connected to Ukraine. So we are based in Ukraine, and it's also a large production place but we did not use a digital transformation before a lot due to not uh, expensive uh, workforce. And uh, in general, that, that was not in, in the focus uh, in Ukrainian manufacturing. But now we see that uh, manufacturing starts to use digital transformation technologies, not to be uh, actually efficient, but uh, provide a better uh, customer value proposition and uh, be more competitive. So I believe that... Uh, if in Ukraine it's already started to use, and uh, it's also a positive uh, sign that uh, this uh, trend is uh, going to be more global and uh, Industry 4.0 will be used uh, and uh, will keep growing. That's all from my side. That's great. Thank you very much. Some really interesting points highlighted there around the supply chains about relocation and manufacturing, um, almost merging 4.0 into the 5.0 discussion as well with the customization. <laughs> it's going back to Shalendra's point. Um, quite a lot to pick up on that. I, I wonder, Shalendra, would you like to pick up on, on some of those points and take this further? So. Yes. Um, I mean, I would like to uh, elaborate uh, 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 further on the technology and the process, or for that matter, employment of technology uh, in creating a smart uh, factory, or for that matter, smart uh, manufacturing. A smart uh, the manufacturing or a factory is highly digitized and uh, connected uh, production facility that relies on smart manufacturing. I mean, if we really look at it, everything is connected, whichever is there on the digital uh, network uh, within the factory. A smart uh, uh, factory may be working uh, uh, by employing technology uh, such as AI, robotics, uh, uh, analytics, uh, big data, IoT, and can uh, run largely autonomously with ability to self-correct. You know, this is very, very important. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're running a very, very fast automated process, there has to be a mechanism which uh, corrects itself uh, by itself. 
and without which uh, we will not be able to run a production facility with the kind of ppm levels which are being demanded on quality by the customers now defining these uh, characteristics of swap uh, factory are uh, visibility connectivity and autonomy now these three things are very very important that the technology has to be visible it has to be connected and uh, it should give that autonomy to that process or uh, the particular factory as such factories have long relied on automation but smart factories take this concept much further and are able to run without much human intervention now this is uh, although an advantage but a country like india this could become a disadvantage because we have a social cause that we need uh, people to get employment because of the population that we have it but then if we start creating uh, outfits where human uh, intervention is not required then it goes against the basic thread of the political uh, system here or the objectives or the mandates which the political parties have got it but nevertheless there are things uh, like we have said in covid what do we support lives or livelihood Uh, is the kind of a question that we need to answer here that do we need uh, uh, a completely digitized uh, uh, smart factory or do we need uh, only a labor force which would create the kind of products uh, that may not be useful for the global market so the technology plays uh, a very important role as far as the process is concerned excessive use of uh, iot sensors and devices connects machines and enables uh, visibility into their condition as well as into the factory process creating what we say as industrial iot uh, double iot what uh, it is a common term i think uh, software guys are famous in creating these abbreviations so <laughs> it is iiot so they were not satisfied with iot so they created another one <laughs> iiot so increasingly sophisticated analytics and application based on ai and machine learning handle many of the routine tasks basically there are so many routine tasks in a manufacturing which will have to be uh, mechanized or digitized so that uh, the process moves much faster freeing up people to focus on handling exceptions and making higher level decisions because the most of the times in the manufacturing when i was running a business unit i have seen that people were busy in doing routine jobs and they were getting stuck on certain things which they should not which were non productive so by employment of this ai and machine learning techniques uh, you know those uh, people will have free time in making some higher level decisions robots are expected to uh, populate smart factories by, for routine work i have seen uh, modular factories in germany in uh, other places now in india where every module for every component uh, there are modules which are created which are handled by either one robots or two or three depending on the kind of operations which are there well these are the were low robotics uh, which are working alongside with the people smart factories rely on smart manufacturing with connects uh, the plant to other entities in the digital supply network which is what i said that the connectivity is very very important you cannot in isolation create a technology base uh, and not get connected with the other digital uh, network uh, which is there at the factory by doing so you uh, enable more effective supply chain management because ultimately what happens everything has to be coordinated the functions in a management uh, if we really look in the operations right from finance hr supply chain management production uh, research and development and marketing they have totally interlinked and interconnected so if we do not supply this basic data into the system and network it properly each function will suffer and the supply chain will be the worst one because they are the people who are uh, uh, dealing with the outsiders to get our productions uh, going so these are very very important things and then another thing uh, that traceability in the system is very very important that whatever we have produced and uh, needs to have a traceability built into that because there are five years of warranties there are 50000 kilometers of warranties which are being given so a particular uh, product failing in the field needs to be traced back in the origin and that particular lot needs to be called back so that there are no further uh, damages to, to the system as such so this is very very uh, important plant floor workers can more readily see information such as instructions schedules quality data inventory status and damage changes now this data was not available on the plant level 
when uh, I used to run an operation, they were all manually created charts and things like that. But today, uh, an operator can uh, look through his mobile or a, a tab and then see through all these uh, uh, data which uh, is relevant to his uh, manufacturing. And this is where uh, I personally feel that the technology has taken over and uh, this has created a lot of convenience for manufacturing and people have been liking it. Even the operators uh, who have been trained on Industry 4.0, who were earlier uh, resorting to the manual uh, sort of uh, manufacturing, they are now getting more into this and then trying to create better products. So uh, maybe these are the issues uh, of employment of technologies. And as we go along, we will touch upon advantages and skills required and uh, issues to be looked at. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Could I bring you both in? I, was, I think you both set out the really interesting agenda of, of the advantages that arise from the adoption. You've also noted some of the consequences of that. I just wondered if we could go perhaps to the, the skills issue as well as some others, which might be the, the barriers to adoption. Because we're thinking about the SME sector, we're thinking about um, smaller manufacturers, how they can um, adapt their processes in order to remain competitive in both their local and perhaps in the markets they would like to break into. So I wonder, Arsene, would you like to, to begin just in reflection of, of uh, what you found amongst your clients has been some of the barriers to the adoption of these, these processes? Yeah, sure. So, uh, like, from the global perspective, uh, uh, the first uh, issue that uh, already been mentioned is uh, that uh, it's hard to keep uh, the same quality standards. And uh, in case if you digitalize uh, your uh, uh, business, so you need uh, by the same uh, changes, uh, transformation and customization and uh, uh, other changes that are connected to businesses. So you need to keep the same quality level and uh, when we are talking about a digital uh, product, it's uh, much harder to uh, keep the same quality level that uh, was uh, that you kept before. So when you are doing uh, all your calculations and uh, in general you are trying to uh, uh, work with, uh, with digital, so it means that uh, you need to uh, you need to make more quality assurance and uh, your uh, engineers, they should be more focused not on the uh, getting uh, uh, the productivity, but uh, on the very first point to uh, make uh, the transformation process with the same quality that was before. So that's very important. Uh, the second point is connected to the more local uh, uh, manufacturers and uh, you need to have uh, a right ecosystem to keep uh, manufacturing in a local place. So in case if you have uh, uh, several suppliers that uh, providing to you some parts of, uh, for your manufacturing, so it, uh, and uh, you might do not have those uh, suppliers uh, in uh, your local country, so you anyway will have to use a uh, uh, more global uh, supply chain and uh, you just can't uh, like, uh, uh, you, you can't uh, uh, find another option uh, unless uh, ordering some parts of manufacturing in uh, other countries. So that's also a point that uh, sometimes uh, because uh, you just uh, uh, you just need to have this ecosystem and uh, the, the right ecosystem is not represented in your region, you you just can't do the transformation that is connected to more local supply chains. That's it. Sorry. You're, you're mute. Yes, you're mute. Sorry, Shalendra, if you could you like to pick up the, uh, pick up the discussion around the barriers. Yes. Uh, I, I, as I said, uh, that my third point, which I would like to... Uh, uh, bring about uh, is the significant advantages of creating an industry 4.0 platform and uh, creating smart ma manufacturing or smart factories. The biggest advantages uh, I would like to highlight, of course, there are going to be several of them. And uh, uh, along with the advantages, there would be disadvantages also, which we'll discuss at a later uh, time. Yeah. But then the lower costs and enhanced revenue generation due to lesser errors self-correction mechanism is the biggest advantage uh, which we have it that uh, uh, ultimately we are in business for revenue 
And if uh, we can maximize the revenue generation with uh, lower costs, that is the aim for everyone. Like we always say that we need the best product at the, uh, the cheapest uh, pr- price. So it is the same way that we need to have the highest revenue uh, with the lower cost. And uh, the self-correcting mechanism really ensures uh, because of uh, the Industry 4.0 uh, platform, uh, which is uh, uh, induced into the manufacturing. The another uh, point uh, which uh, I would like to bring about is the asset efficiency uh, due to self-correction and self-optimization uh, through continual analysis. You know, every asset is very, very important. Uh, it's an investment created uh, by the company and it has to have that uh, life and it has to give uh, that efficiency all along consistently to give that consistent quality. So that asset efficiency plays a big role in uh, creating the advantages uh, when we are employing or migrating to industry four. Improvements in safety and sustainability, because safety is one of the biggest uh, uh, areas which are uh, which is required to be addressed. And the sustainability uh, for this particular process automation is also very, very important because these issues can create uh, problems in running the industry if we do not uh, really have a, a, a look at it. So naturally, migration to Industry 4 ensures improvements in safety and sustainability. Then mass customization and reduced consumption uh, due to 3D printing. Uh, meaning we have been discussing other techniques, but then 3D printing is becoming really uh, very, very common these days. Uh, so. Uh, you could customize uh, the products uh, on a mass scale and uh, reduce uh, consumption. Knowledge transfer due to easy storage and sharing of knowledge. Because uh, on a click uh, of a button, you are sharing knowledge. And uh, this knowledge transfer is very, very important because that gets everyone into the system. Everyone uh, becomes part of that total system. And then there is nothing which is cards close to the chest that somebody is doing. You don't know about it. Because this is a digital platform where... You click at a particular button, you know everything uh, across the board. Quality due to faster uh, detection of flaws. As I said, the self-correction mechanism is nothing but detecting flaws. And then uh, quality improvement uh, uh, is a result of that. The productivity improvements that we have talked, uh, the response to sudden changes also we have spoken. But the micro patches is something which I would like to bring about uh, because MSMEs do not have that kind of a volume. So micro batches produce rapidly and cost effectively. So you can switch on and switch off. So uh, normally in a manual thing, setup times are very, very important. You remove uh, the jigs fixtures and then work it out. But then in this kind of a situation, it is totally programmed to handle micro batches. And the kind of uh, programming you do or the instructions you provide, uh, things will uh, work automatically. And then uh, automatic exchange of real-time data, which is what we say that knowledge transfer. Um, uh, uh, these are a couple of advantages uh, which really go along with that. Now, along with the advantages, uh, I need to also look at uh, the issues which concern us because of this automation or migration to Industry 4. Because when I'm running an industry as a uh, vice president or op- operations chief, you know, there would be job losses. Naturally, if we are working with 3,000 people to produce X volume, tomorrow we may not require those 3,000 people. So it becomes a social uh, cause uh, to be addressed. So job losses will be there. Then a lack of standards, regulations, and forms of certification uh, posing big obstacles. Uh, Meaning when we are doing manufacturing of particular products, uh, there are certain products for which these standards uh, are not defined. The regulations are different. And these have got to be updated as well, because when we are putting a particular process into uh, automation, all the other things need to be standardized and everything has to be a a sort of a Bible. What we say as a uh, uh, we cannot keep changing uh, product by product or we cannot keep changing um, uh, activity by activity. A lot of uh, irrelevant data is generated. (laughs) We also know this. In a digitized world, a lot of irrelevant data is generated and is required to be sorted. Problems of storage of data. This is uh, the bigger problem. Like we always say that when you open the internet to find something, you know, you get 10,000 options. Now, uh, by the time you zero in on a particular option, your search uh, uh, is becoming very, very difficult. So a lot of data is generated. So storage of data 
handling of that data becomes very very problem now there is another aspect a reluctance of stakeholders to invest because the kind of investments which are required for migrating into industry 4.0 are Uh, going to be large because today the lines are tuned up to maybe industry 3 some lines are industry 2.0 and taking them to industry 4.0 would require large amount of investments and stakeholders may ask for a business plan or an roi sort of a thing and that could become a, a hassle it security breaches and unclear legal issues the cyber problem which we are facing so this could be a, an issue which we have to look at because if we rely too much on all these uh, systems with all kinds of passwords if we run through a, a cyber security problem the entire factory can come to a halt uh, the entire digital network could come to an halt so it security breaches uh, is an uh, the same and the biggest uh, challenge for the msm is is going to be the roi which we discussed then the kind of investments and the kind of production scalability they will achieve would they get that kind of a market to get that particular roi that they are missing and uh, next one is the people's management and uh, uh, when i'm talking about people's management the skills uh, which are required to get this particular migration uh, done is that knowledge of digitization and analytics uh, receiving and providing data electronically the guys have got to be trained total this thing understand the process automation it compatibility for every individual who is working on that a lot more of training has to be uh, defined and uh, people have to be made a job relevant uh, what i am saying is that today they may be having skills x tomorrow they have to possess maybe 2x or 3x or uh, maybe additional skills so this kind of a people management thing this is uh, so training of personnel uh, is something which is very very uh, uh, important issue which simultaneously while we are migrating to industry 4.0 needs to be looked at i think uh, with this uh, uh, totally uh, if somebody really takes stock of all these uh, aspects i think we should be somewhere closer to that okay thank you that's a, that's a very long list of both advantages and disadvantages and rasni would you like to pick up some of those issues i, I was wondering about the security point and the skills point do you, in dealing with your clients do they have um, particular issues around uh, the security issues do they have particular issues around finding the, the appropriate skills to uh, to implement and maintain well in general there are uh, uh, there are some best practices that uh, is a must have for uh, running any it product and in case of uh, when we are talking about manufacturing uh, those uh, uh, best practices uh, they are also used uh, there is uh, uh, already established uh, companies that provide in security audit so that's uh, just uh, like something that uh, should be uh, done uh, as uh, you are checking your health so you you should check your product while you are doing development uh, mm-hmm. according to security standards so this is uh, something that uh, is uh, already used on most of the products and uh, we need to understand that uh, that's uh, the process that uh, uh, should be improved constantly because uh, you constantly doing uh, software development and uh, in case of when you are doing when you start to do digital transformation in uh, manufacturing so it means that uh, you're going to uh, keep uh, developing uh, new features and new products during the uh, years and uh, you constantly should uh, uh, keep uh, your product uh, quite secure so and uh, i'm very agree regarding the uh, investment question because uh, any digital transformation uh, and the uh, industry 4.0 means a uh, lot of investments and the uh, roi is a tough question because uh, you need to like uh, it's hard to calculate uh, and compare investments and uh, uh, and benefits that will be uh, get uh, back uh, during the period okay. actually timam i would like to extend one more point that yes. i if i am an oem manufacturer my entire supply chain needs to follow industry 4.0 standards because a weak link in a chain can stop the entire chain so uh, uh, these practices uh, one of the things which we have to look at is that our tier 1 and tier 2 suppliers uh, needs to uh, also be educated to migrate into industry 4.0 so that they gel with the speed with the technology and with the productivity norms those are defined by the oem Okay, thank you. I'm I'm conscious we've we've actually had a, a comment made and some questions mm-hmm. asked by 
by Natalie, and I would, I'd quite like to, to raise these two issues. Uh, just let me read this out. Retrofit is always difficult. What is the best way to approach the greenfield large scale setup? Also, what is the impact on organization charts, role and importance of CIO versus CAO and CTO? I wonder if you can pick up those two issues. First of all, um, the best way to approach greenfield large sales setup. Well, um, uh, who will answer this question? Ashley, please. please. I, 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 I can start, and I believe that uh, like I will partially uh, describe this topic, and uh, you, you will be able to help me. So, uh, from this perspective, based on our experience, uh, first uh, first thing that uh, is need to be done is to uh, create uh, some kind of roadmap of uh, and prioritize what should be uh, what should be done on the very first priority and uh, what will, should be done on the next priorities. And uh, usually, uh, we as a software development company, we are starting uh, this uh, uh, road. From the uh, some kind of request for proposal, which means uh, that uh, company provides uh, their goals, and uh, those goals should be uh, uh, like transformed into some kind of features or user stories that uh, should be in in future developed. So uh, first of all, we need to prioritize uh, uh, what should be done on the first priority, and uh, what is the core of your business, and uh, what is the uh, other parts uh, that are not connected to the core of the business. So probably the core of the business uh, and uh, all uh, main uh, like uh, parts should be uh, the knowledge should be kept inside the uh, business and uh, everything that's not connected to the core uh, can be uh, probably outsourced or you can uh, hire vendors that will be particularly uh, uh, responsible for some part of the uh, some model of the uh, of the product product that should be uh, like in general transformed. Uh, regarding the impact of uh, uh, CIO, CEO, and CTO, so I believe that uh, uh, between CIO and CEO it depends very much on the company, but that's the person that uh, has a product owner kind of uh, according to the Agile methodology will uh, will lead the communication and the uh, product vision from the perspective of business, and uh, he will be responsible for the general product vision. And the CTO part is connected more to the choosing the right development approach, uh, choosing the right uh, stack of technologies that uh, will be uh, first of all uh, actual during the next uh, at least five, five, ten years, and so on. And uh, uh, this uh, approach uh, should be also uh, uh, easy to scale because, uh, as uh, already was mentioned, uh, if we can uh, get uh, potentially more revenue, so we need to have this option. Thank you very much. Shalendra, I yeah. wonder if you wanted to... Yeah, yeah. I would like to answer, Natalie, uh, that uh, initially we will have to define... Uh, whether we are in a high-tech, low-volume business or whether we are in a low-tech, high-volume business. Now, the, based on uh, that kind of a uh, business, uh, we can devise the strategies for creating a greenfield project. Now, any particular project depends on the kind of requirements that you have for uh, the production levels uh, that you need to define. So you have, uh, for a greenfield project, a market research report where you have created certain roadmap uh, as uh, told by my co-panelists and in a roadmap you need to scale up uh, your productions so you need to define uh, what is that going to be the first batch of production when is that you would like to have what is going to be the first year of production what is going to be the next year of production and based on that you will have to uh, really conceptualize a manufacturing setup or a smart factory now once you conceptualize a setup with a modular design, you can augment the capacities as you go along, as you ramp up your production. And then you need to think about investment because for any green project, anybody investing it, ROI is becoming very, very important. So you need to be investing very, very optimally to cope up with your roadmap on uh, demand on the requirements from the markets because you cannot set up an ideal production capacity and look for demands later on. So it is the other way around. You need to understand 
what is your five yearly plan on uh, the or the roadmap uh, requirement of a manufacturing setup and accordingly you will have to create a setup and then invest and it will totally depend on the technology uh, of that particular product as i say it could be high tech low volume or it could be a low tech high volume and accordingly we could uh, really look at that particular greenfield product that's great natalie's asked high tech high volume she's um <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> your views in terms of the CIO versus CIO and CTO. Do you have any observations of that? I'm conscious that we've um, we've come to the end of our session, but we can stay on for a couple of more minutes. It's, um... Well, uh, I am not uh, really conversant uh, with uh, these nomenclatures because when I left the industry uh, 29, 30 years back, uh, you know, we didn't have all these designations. Yeah. But today, I think we have very, very glamorous designations. but well, ultimately there are people who are working uh, uh, contributing uh, in a manufacturing process uh, today they may be called as uh, ctos and then um, uh, the digital uh, uh, person is called maybe information officer and uh, the administration who's running maybe cao